Eyes on Longmont, offering a diversity of topics about our community that will inform and entertain you. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Eyes on Longmont. the Nybot Historical Society Now and Then Lecture Series. I'm Kathy Kaler, President of the Nybot Historical Society. Your video tonight is coordinated by board member Leonard Satanja with videographers Bill Decker and Patrick Bowen. Larry Dorsey is our presenter tonight and railroads are a big part of Nywat's history. Niwot is a railroad town, and the railroad was built in 1873 by the Colorado Central Railroad. Niwot was built on the east and west side of the train tracks. The train tracks go along the diagonal between Boulder to Longmont. The train was a very important part in the start of Niwot in that, uh, that people could come, residents could move here, mail could come, and uh, products, equipment could come here. Then the farmers and business people could ship their pro produce and products to market. There were many railroads connecting in Boulder County in the late 1800s. Today we will take a trip on the Switzerland Trail. It was a narrow gauge railroad and it served the mining communities in our foothills. Larry Dorsey will present the program featuring vintage photographs and um, scenes from the foothills uh, just west of Niwot. Part of the trail today is a walking trail and hiking, and part of the trail also is for Jeep travel. Larry Dorsey is a longtime Boulder County resident. He is a retired history teacher from uh, Fairview High School, Boulder High School, and Centaurus High School. Larry is chair of the Superior Historical Commission. He is trustee emeritus with the Colorado Railroad Museum, which is located in Golden. Larry was the second of the presenters, lecturers, for the Niwot Historical Society lecture series, a long time ago. This is now Larry's fourth story in history about railroads that he is bringing to our audience. Larry Dorsey presents the Switzerland Trail, a Boulder County Railroad. Well, thank you, Kathy, for that fine introduction, and uh, hello, everybody. It's uh, always a pleasure to be here in uh, Niwot at the Niwot Historical Society in uh, beautiful uh, left-hand Grange Hall, a uh, very historic place. And uh, so tonight we're going to be taking a historic trip back in time on the Switzerland Trail. It's a railroad that I'm sure a lot of you have heard of since it was an important part of railroading in Boulder County. Uh, as Kathy said, I'm kind of a railroad fan and um, involved with history preservation uh, down at Superior, Superior Historical Commission, and with railroading at the Railroad Museum. So we're also going to be using the uh, uh, auspices of the Colorado Railroad Museum this evening as well. And uh, so uh, I think the, the introduction covered things very well. Um, I did have a history of teaching in the Boulder Valley Schools. And uh, in my retirement, I'm able to uh, devote a lot of my time to the things that I enjoy, such as uh, railroads and steam engines and things like that. So um, normally, we have a, a pretty good-sized crowd, of course. and uh, 
with this situation are a little bit different. So some of my early slides are oriented more toward a fuller house. But uh, one of those, I can have a creed I live by, I'm sure all of you do too, and so uh, we, uh, whoops, we do like to plan ahead, and, and I would like to take a minute to uh, do a real quick plug for the Superior Historical Museum, which normally would be open on the first Saturday of every month, but unfortunately with our current circumstances, it's not, but just keep this in mind as something to do when our COVID experience is over and things are back more to normal. Um, we have a little uh, miners camp, mine, I'm sorry, miners house from the industrial mine camp that's now our museum at 2nd and Maple Street in original Superior. Included in that is a, an HO scale diorama of the industrial mine, which is shown there. Uh, I'm gonna take a moment since I've got this little red dot right here, here's my, um, my laser pointer. So when I'm talking about pointing out something, look for this red dot, please, and hopefully we'll be able to find it okay. Um, now, uh, normally with uh, this place packed with people, we'd have to make sure that uh, the ladies are careful with uh, their chapeaus, and to have equal time, of course, we'd encourage the gentleman not to uh, spit on the floor or any other place like that. So, um, Oops, so Switzerland Trail. Uh, this was a marketing name that was uh, devised back in the eight, late 1800s. We'll go through how that came about. But here we are, we're gonna do the early years up to 1898. I'm sure many of you are aware that the Bible on the Switzerland Trail is the Forest Crossan book, The Switzerland Trail of America. Uh, Forest Crossan, a unique uh, character of the Old West who resided in Boulder and was an old railroader and newspaper man. And uh, he wrote this book and then uh, there's two editions out there so keep your eye on it, out for it because it, uh, it is the source authority when it comes to the Switzerland Trail Railroad. A Little bit of background first. Uh, to start with, um, railroading in Colorado, Colorado Territory is connected back to the Transcontinental Railroad, the construction of it uh, across Nebraska and into Wyoming, but before it got to Wyoming, it clipped the northeast corner of Colorado Territory up by the town of Julesburg. So here we see the um, construction crews laying rail up around Julesburg. So Julesburg was at the end of the line, uh, western terminus of this uh, construction project. It, it was kind of a wild and woolly place, place, and I think it's hard for us to imagine today that Julesburg was once called the wickedest little city in the west. Since they went to Cheyenne and then on to Ogden, Utah, Denver got passed up and the head of the Union Pacific Railroad uh, just uh, blew Denver off. It's too dead to bury, he said. So Denver is, really is in a, a tight spot here because economically speaking, um, being bypassed by the Transcontinental Railroad was a real financial setback. So the um, big moguls of Colorado Territory finance and politics um, put together their resources and built the railroad from Denver up to Cheyenne, the Denver Pacific, and that connected uh, the uh, soon to be capital city of Colorado Territory with the new city built by the railroad, Cheyenne, Wyoming. So at the very beginning of this saga, we have a big competition between the cities of Golden and Denver about prominence in uh, Colorado Territory. You probably know, many of you do, history buffs that Golden was a territorial capital for quite, some, quite a few years. And Denver, of course, became the uh, competitor to Golden. And we see some very significant names in Colorado history and I'm using my laser pointer now, so there should be a red dot by Mr. Loveland, Teller, Bertha, these are all names that are prominent in territorial and early statehood uh, politics and business. And so Denver, this is the Colorado Central Railroad that Kathy mentioned in the introduction, and the Union Pacific and all of its subsidiaries. Union Pacific was a classic um, octopus-like 
uh, corporation in that time period. It had its tentacles every place, and there were all sorts of railroads um, of different names that were connected or subsidiaries of Union Pacific. Here we see some more of the important names from that time period. Uh, so the competition is on. And this map, so way down here, that red dot's close to the bottom of the map, there's Golden. So at one time, the railroad to Boulder came out of Golden and went up, kind of paralleled Indiana Street near Stanley Lake and then into Boulder. And in the meantime, there was another railroad that came straight across from Brighton to Erie and right up the uh, Boulder Creek. So here are those two railroads, the Colorado Central, April of 1873, it comes to Boulder. And as Kathy mentioned, it just kept right on going, went through Niwot and Longmont and eventually uh, up to Cheyenne. And then the other railroad is the Denver and Boulder Valley. Uh, and as I said, it went right up Boulder Creek, so it was really a Boulder Valley Railroad. This was a Union Pacific subsidiary. And uh, when I first moved to Boulder in the late 1960s, there was still traffic on that line and right into the city. They'd park their Union Pacific freight trains right there at 28th and Pearl Street, and go eat at the uh, at one of the local restaurants. The train crew would go eat at one of the local restaurants. So Denver wins the competition. So this map is where my red dot is, is showing Denver. And so this route that originated to Boulder now comes out of Denver. Denver becomes the territorial capital. And here are those two lines. And this also shows the branch near Louisville that went through Superior, Marshall, University, and and again, the Denver and Boulder Valley. So one of these Union Pacific subsidiaries was the Union Pacific and Gulf. This is a very early photograph, maybe one of the earliest photographs of a train in Boulder. And that's uh, a line of stock cars there. And uh, notice the track is still unfinished, and there are three rails in this track, this dual gauge track. There's both standard and narrow gauge on the same roadbed. So, standard gauge is four feet, eight and a half inches between the rails. Narrow is anything narrower. Most common is three foot gauge, as we call it. Uh, so what's gonna happen is that the inner city, big inner city trains are gonna be on standard gauge. Going into the mountains will be narrow gauge because it's, uh, it's easier to construct, uh, less expensive, and it could make uh, tighter turns, tighter radiuses. Um, not as expensive to construct, and frankly, the standard gauges probably couldn't get through some of these canyons in Boulder County. I'm going to show you a map now of Boulder back um, late 1800s, early 1900s. So here comes that line from Denver, and there's takes that right turn up to Niwot. I'm sure all of you have been in this location where my cursor is right now because that's about 34th and Pearl Street and that's where you get stopped by the train as it's going uh, from Denver to Cheyenne and it takes a long time for 125 or 30 rail cars to go by. So there's, that, that's about 30th and um, Pearl. This street right here is called Water Street. If I had a bunch of people here, I'd ask, what that street is known as today, maybe Kathy probably knows. Water Street is now known as Canyon Boulevard. Yeah, so the street that um, the street that's now a major east-west artery was once the railroad tracks with two um, lanes, one on each side of the tracks going different directions. Right there is where the uh, depot is, was, at 14th and uh, Water, now Canyon. And uh, so this is what, what the trackage looked like back then. Here comes the uh, Denver and Boulder, I'm sorry, the Boulder Valley Railroad coming up from Erie. And so here's a Y. So what happened is train to come from Denver, come that way, and then come down into the center of the city. And this map 
for modern people, is a really uh, there's a lot of information in this map. So here's here's Twelfth uh, Street, now known as Broadway, and so all this area here to the west of Broadway, clear to about Fourth Street, was all the rail yards. So this is full of all sorts of trackage, uh, the turning Y. This right here where the cursor is right now is probably about where the library, the new library built in the 1960s is located, and the new library is across the creek. And um, oh, so this is probably about the St. Julian Hotel, a little different now. Uh, it was an industrial area, the train yards, literally. Um, and about right in here would be the Justice Center. And right this where my cursor is now, that's the, that is the uh, engine house. So they had a, an engine house where they pulled maintenance on the locomotives. So quite a different scene along Canyon Boulevard today compared to what it might have been, say, in 1900. And here's that engine house. So that's about 4th Street and uh, Canyon Boulevard. And up in the background, you see the Settlers Park. And so here's a couple locomotives, two stalls. And so it wasn't a real big operation, but that's where they pulled maintenance on the locomotives, uh, the Switzerland Trail locomotives. One of the incidents that took place down in the uh, train yards in that location was a huge dynamite explosion. And this shows the aftermath. Here's where the explosion took place, where my cursor is now. And what happened was a little labor uh, spat, shall we say. Um, they had some strikers and some strike breakers from the union, uh, the railroad union. And a union man was sure that a boxcar, in a boxcar, was sleeping some strike breakers. And so his idea was to set off some dynamite in this car and uh, set fire to this car and to scare him out. Well, it turns out that the car was loaded with dynamite heading up to one of the mines. And uh, what happened was an immense explosion that blew out plate glass windows in Pearl Street and left a huge crater. And three, the three guys in the um, uh, boxcar died. The uh, perpetrator of the crime was convicted and sent down to Canyon City to the state pen. So that was right about where the uh, St. Julian Hotel is right now. So why build a railroad into the mountains? Well, it's been shown that uh, in the research that um, to ship ore out of the mountains by uh, wagon and horse or mule would cost about $20 a ton. Ship it out by rail was about $1 a ton. So there's an economic motivation for this uh, big time. This shows going the other way. Instead of coming out, what about going in to the mountains? And we see here, uh, what looks to be a, probably a steam boiler heading off to a mine or a mill being pulled on a wagon by six horses. This is right in the city limits of Boulder, They're getting ready to go up into the hills. And uh, so you can see what it takes to um, transport something into those uh, horse, horse and uh, wagon days. Here's another one, eight horses. And look at this, this road hardly can be con considered a real road. And here's this wagon with, again, what appears to be a steam boiler being taken up to a mine. So the alternative, here's a not very large, a narrow gauge uh, flat car. And uh, you compare the, the load ability of this uh, railroad car to the wagons. And then imagine having uh, 10 or 12 or 20 uh, freight cars on the train. So that this is a motivation is much more efficient transportation, more profitable, of course, and uh, effective. So the, our railroad that goes into the mountains had three different names. The first uh, incarnation is called the Greeley, Salt Lake, and Pacific. It was kind of an interesting name since it didn't go to any of those places. Uh, it didn't start in Greeley or go to Salt Lake City and certainly not to the Pacific Ocean. Um, and in fact, is this incarnation here, it went 13 miles into the mountains to the town of Sunset up in Four Mile Canyon. So it had a long way to go yet to get to the uh, Pacific Ocean. Um, then we 
had it recapitalized uh, and became known as the Colorado and Northwestern. So you see a lot of CNNW uh, stamps on, let's say, railroad equipment like uh, switch keys or something. In this case, it's not the Chicago and Northwestern, it's the uh, Colorado and Northwestern. And this is one to come up with the Switzerland Trail moniker. And then later, uh, another, one more try at recapitalizing, it became known as the Denver, Boulder, and Western. Now the old timers like to make up these funny names with the initials. So D, B, and W, so that stands for drink beer and wine. And uh, the, the, another one was the CNS, they called that, the CNS was the crooked and slow. Or the DNRG was the dirty and rather greasy. So uh, this was a real common thing that the old timers like to do with uh, the acronyms. So, the Greeley Salt Lake and Pacific laid its tracks uh, in the boulder in the yards and then up Four Mile Canyon, arriving at sunset in 1883. So the, uh, we're tapping into all the, all the mines and mills of Boulder County. Now this map is going to show uh, leaving Boulder, goes west of Boulder, to, and then Four Mile Canyon takes a right turn going north and northwest through Salina and Wall Street, all familiar names I'm sure for a lot of you, terminating at sunset. So that was a 13-mile uh, trip. It was a pretty revolutionary because even though it was not uh, getting to every community in Boulder County, the mine owners could get their materials to the sites along the route and have, their, have it transported to um, back into Boulder or wherever it's going next. So, so here is a, what was called Oradell, which is just right there where, right now, where my cursor is. This would be the highway going up to Nederland, and then you, had, you can turn into um, Four Mile Canyon. Right now there's something like a, some kind of a camp or something right there uh, in the trees. A lot more trees in this um, canyon than there used to be back in the old days. Um, if we were, had our usual crew here, I'd be warning you right now that there's going to be a test and so on this material. I didn't think I mentioned it earlier. And so here's the first clue about the upcoming test. How many bridges were between 4th Street and Sunset? Keep that in mind. I took a little drive up Four Mile Canyon, oh, six, eight weeks ago to kind of see how things had changed since I was there last. And huge changes, a um, lot more homes, and then what I noticed really was how many more trees there were along the creek, especially. Um, and it seemed a lot more overgrown than it did when I used to drive up there frequently. So here's the little town of Sunset. And uh, so here you have a Y here, so that's enabled them to turn the engine or turn the train to change directions because this photograph was taken after um, the other two lines were built. So it's a little bit misleading. Uh, this line goes off to uh, Eldora and this line goes off to uh, Ward. It wasn't there in 1883. Okay, so imagine it's not there now. Um, so this is where they went first. And here we see an eastbound train heading back down to Boulder. They turned that on the Y. They had a little depot there inside the Y. And um, this was a very typical passenger setup, a combination baggage and passenger car and a conventional passenger coach. Here's the depot at Salina. And by the way, you may be seeing this watermark on a lot of these photographs, these are from uh, Carnegie Library, and by using them with the uh, watermark, uh, you don't have to pay to use them, so there they are. Uh, boy, I wonder if there's ever any problem with flooding in Four Mile Canyon around Salina. <laughs> Look how close this depot is to the Four Mile Creek, and uh, we know, especially in 2013, we know how serious the flood was in Salina. So here's a little Salina Depot uh, tucked away in this canyon. Here's another view of it. Um, 
When I first originated this uh, slideshow, I did a tag team with Sylvia Petham, and we did it at uh, Gold Hill Historical Society. So I got a little bit of emphasis on Gold Hill here for a couple of minutes. Because you know, if hopefully you've been to Salina and been up Four Mile Canyon, um, know what that's look like now. Here's a really important uh, old timetable. For one thing, I love this map because it's, it's almost like somebody dropped some spaghetti on this uh, um, piece of paper or something. Uh, it's way out of, uh, uh, out of scale. You have about a half an inch to go from Denver to Boulder, and then you have all this other space for the shorter version, of shorter distances up in the mountains. But there was the railroad, the Switzerland Trail, never went to Gold Hill itself. They had a Gold Hill station, but it was about one or two miles to the west of Gold Hill. So this shows the connection. They had to take the stagecoach. If you want to go to Gold Hill and you want to take the train, you had to ride the stagecoach from Salina to Gold Hill, which a lot of you know if you've been there, that's a pretty steep grade up out of Salina to Gold Hill. And so here, there's the stagecoach. It looks like something out of an old Western movie, doesn't it? I always thought they, are, they didn't have that many people on a stagecoach, but here you can see, I think that would have to be kind of top heavy myself. I don't know how you feel about it, but uh, there they go. They're gonna go to Gold Hill. And this, uh, see how well we can read this. Uh, the stuff I've highlighted tells us that it takes it took um, it's three and a half miles from Salina to Gold Hill, and it took about, let's see, it started at uh, 10.20, got there at 12 noon, so it was almost, uh, what was that? Somebody help me on that. I had it calculated one time. But it took a couple hours anyway to get from Salina up to Gold Hill, and it took, I think it's two and a half hours, and it takes about two hours to come back because they couldn't let it get going too fast. So there's life in the old days. There really were stagecoaches hauling you know, tons of passengers um, in those kinds of circumstances. Well, uh, here's the big event that changes the history of the uh, Switzerland Trail Railroad, and that is the great flood of 1894. And so here's the depot, and here's the bay window, so we're trackside, so we're looking west right into the canyon, but we can't see it for the overcast. And so this is Boulder Creek water, clear up to the depot at uh, Canyon Boulevard and 14th Street. Um, okay, test takers, how many bridges? 60. 60 bridges. The problem that happened was nine inches of rain or three inches or over three days, and what happened was that the, uh, as the water rose and started eroding things and washing things away, it started washing away the bridges, and the bridges became debris as they went downstream, and they would in turn take out other bridges. So between the, uh, all the logs, from down trees, and probably parts of building and, uh, buildings and the bridges, the bridges were all wiped out and completely devastated the railroad. And you can see poor old Locomotive 155 is looking like it's in trouble over there in the background. And um, here we see some of the local lads watching the uh, excitement of the flood. So there's, now we're looking south toward University Hill and there's Boulder Creek. And look how, how much is covered here. And there's the university buildings off in the distance. Uh, so this is a, an immense setback. It takes four years to recapitalize this railroad. And so not only did they rebuild the line from Boulder to Sunset, then they took off on the project of building another branch, one branch to Ward and another branch to Eldora. And I love these old guidebooks and things. Uh, some of you may know a local a uh, collector by the name of Rick Sinner. He has all sorts of advertising uh, uh, paraphernalia, including train stuff, and this was one of his. But um, Switzerland Trail Guidebook. And we see where it says, uh, health, wealth, lofty mountains, 
fertile valley. So this is a little guidebook that the passenger could take along with them and point out things along the route. So here's the, that route, route is where it goes from sunset up to Mont Alto and then to the, another um, version of the uh, Gold Hill Station on to various sightings into mines and into Ward. Uh, so here's the newspaper write-up about the contest winner. Actually, our new railroad came up with um, this contest. Whoever could come up with the best slogan would get $10, a princely sum back in those days, I guess. And so this is, is pure marketing, 19th century style. And we see it in that same time period over in uh, Uray, for example. They call it the Switzerland of America. So um, the, the, this attraction of the Swiss Alps as a, as a marketing uh, uh, tool, tool, sorry. So uh, this superintendent, I haven't determined if he's a superintendent of schools or what, but at any rate, Superintendent Snook won the $10 contest out of over 200 suggestions, and uh, the railroad then added the uh, Of America, Switzerland Trail of America. A very common thing to do would be to uh, load up and go to Mont Alto, and uh, there's the park, uh, there's a lodge there, and a uh, fountain, a very nice place. A lot of times in those days what they would do would and organizations like unions, churches, fraternal organizations would charter the train and, uh, and take their, the whole train would transport, let's say, the um, organization like the Knights of Pythias or somebody like that, the Redmen and the uh, Knights of the World and all those kinds of people, unions like the United uh, Railroad Workers and so on, and they'd go up we have uh, some passenger cars and then a box car, oftentimes uh, stocked up with beer and, uh, and ice to keep it cool. Now, I said note this dormer because we're going to see it again. Uh, and you'll see why. We have a little problem with facts. The Forest Service has incorrectly um, titled this Mount Alto, not Mont Alto. And uh, according to Sylvia Pedham, uh, they don't have any plans of changing it. So <laughs> I guess that's going to persist unless somebody really gets on them. Um, so that's incorrect. It was Mont Alto. Uh, there's all sorts of cool things you could do in taking a trip like this. And one might be to uh, take a ride back to Boulder or wherever uh, on, a, uh, on a hand car. So you just, uh, uh, they'd hook that on the back of the train and they got to where they, let it go, just let it go and coast downhill. And uh, looks like fun to me. Or you could maybe stop the train and let people go pick strawberries. Off in the distance here is the train standing and waiting for its passengers to come back. And uh, a common problem in Colorado Mountain Railroading was the persistence of snow in the wintertime. And so we, well, it makes for a nice pose but also can cause some problems with the get a locomotive caught in a snow slide, as we see here. Uh, here's the tender back here, here's the coal bunker and the water tank. And so I think we're looking down into the uh, cab of the locomotive, the, the top's been torn off. So a little bit of a hazard and uh, very typical of Colorado Mountain Railroading. Well, it's time to reorganize again. And so uh, they have a last gasp, as I'm calling it. That was the Colorado Northwestern. Now we're going into the phase called the Denver, Boulder, and Western. And we'll take a minute to talk about the line that went to Eldora. And so again, there's Sunset. There's Sugarloaf. Oh, about right in here is probably where the Peak to Peak Highway is, Caribou Ranch, and the town of Eldora. Not the ski area, but the town. And uh, so this uh, is the Glacier Lake, and note the dormer. There's the same dormer in the same building. Well, how do you get over there? Well, the people decided that the 
customers had dwindled so much on the uh, ward branch that they disassembled the entire lodge and put it on some flat cars and took it over to Glacier Lake and reassembled it. So today when you go to Mont Alto, there's a chimney there and a lot of people think, oh, it must have burned down or something, but actually this took, this took it apart and reassembled it. So um, there it is at the Glacier Lake. You've got a little siding there, there's some trains on the on a Y. And I love this picture, kids frolicking at Glacier Lake and on the back of this photo it said uh, July, July 4th, 1904. On this route to Eldora was a stop called Cardinal. Now this picture has a lot of stuff in it. And here comes the railroad through that cut, across this great trestle, and toward us like that. So the depot's over here. This building on the side of the hill over here is the Cardinal Mill. And the Cardinal Mill has been uh, uh, saved and is in the possession of Boulder County Open Space. And if the timing's right, you can get a chance to see it if there's some county personnel on staff, on staff that day. Um, now, this is also important, not because it uh, had a, uh, was probably a gold extraction mill there, but also because if you're going to go to Nederland, this is where you get the stage to Nederland. So the rest of this paragraph, which I don't think you'll be able to read well, says that um, you can also go to Cardinal, from Cardinal to Nederland, one and a half miles. So it did, the train did not go directly to Nederland. There's a nice shot of a uh, locomotive 32 coming through a cut on its way to uh, Eldora. Maybe all these people were in those cars. This is the typical, like I was saying earlier, about how the uh, fraternal organizations and church groups would uh, charter a whole train. Part of that was usually getting their pictures taken at some point along the way. And here we are coming into the Eldora station. Not exactly a Union Grand Central station here. Pretty small. That building still exists. It's part of uh, Dr. Doug Dart's uh, summer cabin now. So uh, this is kind of on the south side of the creek, South Boulder Creek. So if we're looking back toward the town of Eldora, here's the schoolhouse, and then there's the, all the community. And back in here, there's a building where my cursor is right now with a dormer on its roof too. And it's still there. Uh, it was up there a few years ago. It's called the Miners, the Gold Miners Hotel. It's a bed and breakfast and very uh, quaint and funky. Uh, so in this branch, again, we've got our snow issue. So one way to cope with that is something called a rotary snow plow. It has a series of blades that circulate like this and acts kind of like uh, the snow blower you might have in your garage. And sulfide flats I calculate to be roughly around where uh, Nederland Junior Senior High is located today. So here we are getting the tracks cleared off on the way to Eldora. Well, there was one interesting little side trip, so to speak, with this uh, branch, and that is that they built a, a stub down to the uh, construction site of the Barker Reservoir, Barker Dam, creating the Barker Reservoir. And so this uh, is the uh, reservoir construction site looking back toward the town of Nederland. So they, the railroad, the uh, dam construction company paid for this uh, um, branch uh, and then uh, it was torn up after it was finished because obviously it's going to be underwater at some point. Okay, so this is 1909, we're on our way to 1920, little interlude of something called World War I. And at the same time as a development of Americans' uh, fascination with vehicles with rubber tires on them and engines. And here's a little variation on uh, that kind of an automobile called a Stanley Steamer. And his, this picture is taken in Boulder and uh, so tourists could now go up the new road to Nederland uh, up Boulder Canyon, bypassing the Four Mile Canyon route, and 
go to Nederland. Why go to Nederland? So they can keep on going to Estes Park because the same Mr. Stanley also constructed that marvelous hotel in Estes Park. So Boulder, Lyons, Longmont, Loveland, Fort Collins all had stations where people could take the Stanley Steamer automobile up their very respective canyons, eventually getting to Estes Park uh, to the Stanley Hotel. Well, this didn't help the railroad any, did it? Furthermore, with a highway, well, a, a navigable automobile road up Boulder Canyon, this means that more and more people are going to be using their personal cars and the trucks to haul out the ore. So after the uh, World War I decline of economic activity and uh, another flood in 1919, trucks, buses, automobiles, the Switzerland Trail uh, was uh, defunct. And in some places, there are, you can take a hike on the, some of the remaining roadbed. There's quite a bit of it that's still um, possible to walk on, ride your bicycle or trail bike. Uh, as Kathy said way back at the beginning, uh, the um, uh, four-wheel drive in a lot of places too, because not that it's so, too steep, but I found those are so rocky, it's just really difficult to uh, take a uh, conventional car over that. So enjoy it on foot or bicycle or... Um, you know, Leonard informed me about a very interesting uh, uh, anniversary happening about right now. So, The uh, day before yesterday, I was uh, hiking up at the uh, Caribou Open Space, Boulder County, and uh, there's an educational sign up there that tells about how uh, tomorrow, October 1st, 2020, is going to be the 100-year anniversary of uh, the removal of the last rail of the Switzerland Trail. And so it's quite a significant uh, day. And I wanted to ask you, Larry, if um, there are so many rails that went up in these seemingly serving small towns, um, do you think there will ever be rail again? Um, serving any of the, like Nederland or any touristy uh, narrow gauge tra uh, rails? Well, I doubt it, Leonard. Um, I think uh, what we'll see with tourist railroads will be utilizing the ones, the lines that are already in effect, so, or roadbeds that are un, untampered with. But uh, I think overall, uh, it's all automobiles anymore, so, yeah. And thanks for that. Uh, uh, personal insight on that because uh, the, the scrapping of this railroad, like many railroads, is a big deal. They have a, a company out of Denver that specialized in it, pulled up the rails and either resold the rails or sent them off to the, be melted down. And same with the locomotives and things like that. A lot of the locomotives are resold and used by other railroads, but uh, a uh, major scrapping project for sure. And again, in the spirit of reusing materials, here we have a picture of the Boulder County Courthouse. And you're probably wondering, why is that in the slideshow on the Switzerland Trail? Well, the original courthouse burned down, I think it was 1932, and it had to be rebuilt, of course, and so this is Depression days by that time, and so a great proportion of the stones used in the construction of this building were made from the old bridge abutments from the Switzerland Trail. So they went up into the canyons, uh, took the blocks, brought them down to the yard, the courtyard, and um, they had a big sock uh, uh, stone cutting operation there, and they cut them to size, and that became part of the building materials for the new Boulder County Courthouse. I'm gonna spend a few minutes on Switzerland Trail locomotives, and I have a goal behind this because a lot of you are probably pretty familiar with one particular Switzerland Trail locomotive. So the rod engine is one like this where the push rods are on the outside and they push back and forth and that makes the wheels go around. Uh, and this is a great painting by Howard Fogg, who is a very famous um, local Boulderite um, uh, artist who 
whose work showed up all around the world. But the rod engine has a maximum. A 2% grade is, is a fairly steep grade in railroading. Uh, railroaders would be happy they could have a completely straight line with no curves, uh, quite level. And uh, that's not reality. Uh, so in Colorado, narrow gauge railroading, we had a lot of 4% grade and a very unusual piece that Salinas supposedly had a, a short few hundred yards of about 5 to 7% grade. But the point is that the 4% is all a rod engine can handle. That's, after that, they just cannot do that sort of steep elevation. So the result of that is that many railroads developed geared locomotives, and their purpose of those was uh, they, since they had a system of gears, uh, cogs and gears around the, on the wheels, that they could go up steeper grades, but of course they were limited on, how, on speed, very slow. So here's a Climax locomotive, part of the Switzerland Trail locomotives, and here's a Shea locomotive, one of the more famous and uh, locomotive that rail fans really like, because you get to see all this apparatus here working, turning the cogs and the wheels and making it go up steep grades. Uh, here's, uh, here's our old friend number 30. That's the one I want to focus on for a few minutes. A beautiful painting uh, showing uh, number 30 coming down from, maybe from Ward. His name happens to be Richard Ward, and he is from England, and he painted this without ever coming to the United States. So he painted that based on a photograph, but a nice job. And here's number 30 in the yards uh, by the, uh, by the engine house on around 4th, 5th Street. And what I'm building up to, ladies and gentlemen, is you probably recognize this locomotive as being the one that was in Boulder's Central Park for years and years, along with some other equipment. But unfortunately, uh, after having one caboose completely destroyed by dynamite, another one burned seriously in constant vandalism, the city of Boulder and the Colorado Railroad Museum arrived at an agreement where the locomotive is now on display at the Colorado Railroad Museum in Golden. And so those of you who remember that from uh, uh, the old days in Central Park, Boulder, can go see it again uh, at the Railroad Museum. Uh, it's an arrangement we have with the city of Boulder and uh, it's uh, been a good arrangement. They've been helped, very helpful with the maintenance. Um, and we also have this caboose that was burned so seriously a few years ago, and uh, coach number 280. All of these are on, uh, accessible at the Railroad Museum, along with even, this is the possession of the Railroad Museum, one Colorado Northwestern boxcar. Uh, for you folks, if you can prove you're a Boulder County resident on October the 23rd, you get free admission to the Railroad Museum as part of the agreement with the uh, city of Boulder and the Railroad Museum. Well, railroading days aren't the same now. Trains are very prominent in our society, but there are freighters and there are all kinds of freight transportation and coal transportation, but the era of passenger tra travel as we once knew it is gone. A sad day. And it, when you could imagine being able to hop on a train in uh, downtown Boulder and end up in Ward a couple hours later. And that brings us to the end of the program. And I'd like to give credit to my sources of photos and images to all these uh, locations. And it's been very much a pleasure to be able to share with you the history of the Switzerland Trail of America, Boulder's narrow gauge Railroad. <laughs> All right. okay. Thunderous applause there. <laughs> All right. Any questions? Any questions? With, with these, um, the several efforts to, and you talked about the recapitalization of the railroad at times, several efforts, uh, different companies to get it to work. How really profitable um, were these railroads and were some of the big uh, industrialists and, bear, uh, you know, 
and uh, big names that you mentioned at the beginning, were they involved in these uh, seemingly small uh, town railroads? Uh, yes, they were, yeah. Again, at the beginning, uh, we saw that the, uh, some of this early construction was done by subsidiaries of Union Pacific, and this was Jay Gould, who was the, probably the prototype uh, robber baron. And uh, so this was a, a lot, of, uh, lot of big money, uh, but did they make money? Did they make money? Uh, in those days, the um, financial corruption was centered around uh, corporations like railroads that were being, uh, you know, la money laundering and things like that were going on. So money was being made, and a lot of times by some kind of uh, questionable techniques, especially um, the long haul, short haul uh, situation that they would do with the farmers charging more for uh, the short haul than the long haul, for example. Uh, most of those individuals you saw in that one slide were financially very well off, but a lot of them were also on the precipice a lot of times. So the, one, one little mistake and it was a disaster. We had depressions in the United States in 1873 and 1893. The one in 1893 was especially bad because that was the silver crash where the government stopped buying silver for, uh, for its, it was, the money was backed by gold and silver for quite a while. And once that happened, the silver mines uh, went kaput. And uh, so uh, the, this was, um, it was high finance at that time, that's for sure. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. You're welcome. How much steam pressure is typically in these uh, older uh, steam locomotives? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's around 180 pounds per square inch. Um, the, the system uh, holds a lot of steam, and uh, um, I think one of the most uh, fun things that happens down at the Railroad Museum when we have live steam operations is when the pop-off valve goes off, and all of a sudden there's this great sound and this great noise, and there's this great steam of uh, plume of steam coming up out of the uh, out of the pop-off valve. So I think it's 180, degree, uh, 180 PSI. Thank you, Larry, for coming. And I hope you all enjoyed the trip on the Switzerland Trail and the, all the history of railroading here in Boulder County. Have a good evening. Mm -hmm.